I feel like we should have more room technology or some shit. You know what I'm saying? I think shit is like flying up from the ocean to the sky. It's like uh, surfing in some oil spillage. Inhaled like a whole bag of goose feathers. I worry primarily about whether there are nightclubs in heaven. Microphones are mostly budget mics, like 50 to 150 bucks. Gotcha. Hmm. All right, so we have established that basically anytime you trick, bamboozle, or hoodwink somebody, it should just be referred to as cucked. You have cucked them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it's been it's been so overused that I think the word no longer has any meaning except what we ascribe to it. So exactly. So yeah, anytime like you can just. Pull a simple, a simple dupe on somebody, trick them. Maybe just use a well-crafted pun, and then, oh, you you cucked that person. They were cucked. Yeah, uh, I mean, you ask why did the chicken cross the road? Whatever they say, they they've cucked themselves <laughs> yeah. at any point just by entering that interaction. Yeah, and then you just say to get to the other side. Boom, cucked you. <laughs> I like this. I I do too. It's just. We're just ruining a word that ruins conversation, so we're fixing we're fixing language really right here. Two wrongs do Cuckle make a Barry right. Fan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. What's the what's that old dog cartoon? Huckle something. Uh oh, it, Cuckleberry Hound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clifford the big red cuck. <laughs> Cuckled the big red dog. <laughs> Instead of Arthur, it's just cuckled. <laughs> cuckled the art and cuckled the aardvark. Yeah. Is that is that his name or a command? <laughs> Can it be both? Fair. Yeah. Folks, welcome to Oh Well You Cuckolds. Uh, this is our this is our podcast. Oh cuck you bastards. Oh cuck you bastards. Uh, we're we're still we're still up in the air on the title, but uh. We're bringing back Giannis Wagner. Hello. Yeah. All the way back from episode, Lord. episode four. All the way back. That actually is wild to think about. I know, right? You were one of our early episodes. Yeah. I dab. You can't see it, but I he, just did. He just dabbed super hard. It's. I, I, feel, I felt it. I felt it in my bones. It was a monumental dab. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drinking some Rockstar... Shouts out to Rockstar. I'm a I'm a brand uh, ambassador. I'm a brand ambassador for Rockstar Energy Drink. How much are they paying you for that? Nothing. Uh, and they don't know I am. Oh, but this I'm podcast trying... brought to you by Rockstar Pure Zero. So they so they pay an experience, specifically the Rockstar experience. <laughs> yeah, 240 milligrams of caffeine per can, eight cans a day. You could say I'm into fitness. 16 fluid ounces of experience. <laughs> uh, when I used to go to more metalcore shows, some of them would be sponsored by Rockstar, like Taste of Chaos Tour. Oh, yeah. And when Avenged Sevenfold and Atreyu played San Diego, I got free Rockstar at the end of the night, so I drank at like 11 p.m. Hell Somehow yeah. Somehow went to sleep on Rockstar. Hell yeah. How? I don't know. I guess I was just tired enough from the pit. The pit. Did you get crowd killed and or did you crowd kill? Uh, not that show, but other shows I got crowd killed heavily. There was, uh, one show at Epicenter where I got the living shit kicked out of me by, like, a crew. Oh, no. I got chased out of the venue. I was 16. I was skinny. I was wearing a collared shirt. So I Ooh. think one of those is why they targeted me. I mean, it's, it's probably just like a perfect storm. Of... It's just a perfect storm of a teenage cock. Yeah. Getting cocked. <laughs> yeah. So I went to In school with a black realm. eye the next day. That sucks. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they're too hopped up on rock star. His, his yeah, because they're straight edge. So yeah. how they party is rock star. Your eye totally got cucked by that guy's fist. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But yeah, San Diego. San Diego. It is a place. I'm more of a North County kind of fellow because that is where I live, mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to drive until I was 18, so most everything I did was just in my own little locale, but 
remember going to noise noise shows down noise. in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Noise scene's better than the punk scene here. Yeah, that's what I've heard. At least like in terms of this the social stuff. I guess in terms of literally hearing it, noise isn't that much better than punk. Yeah, I mean they're but... both pretty abrasive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Noise scene parties. Punk gets wrapped up in politics that I don't necessarily agree with. Yeah, the noise scene is more like uh, people are the, just there to put their teeth on glass with contact mics <laughs> attached to it. And, and and eat a bowl of nails. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Nailos. <laughs> Nailos. You know, it, that's that's like my fifth favorite cereal. I, it would be higher up if it wasn't for honestly it's just the texture of nalos that gets to me yeah yeah you don't like that hard teeth breaking iron <laughs> just in your mouth it's not the hardness or the stabbing pain or the or the tetanus that really gets to me it's just like the nails kind of have the nalos kind of have like this sort of chalkboard texture to them mm. and like they shatter my teeth but it's more just the feeling on my teeth before they shatter them that's really <sighs> It's just, it just puts my teeth on edge, you know. It's like it's like yeah. those it's like those Necco wafers. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's only awful. only super hard and made of metal, and they stab going down. <sighs> the metal band nails should have a and coming out of them. Right? You will never be one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Actually, they could sell out the merch table. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's the? Aren't there a bunch of? What's that one band that does nothing but... Mer- oh, ACD, uh, ACX, ACX, DC, DC. Yeah. yeah. They would have, like, baby footsies and beer koozies and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> what would their cereal be? Um, Antichrist Demon Crisps. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best one, probably. <laughs> Introducing the world's first spicy cereal. <laughs> But what, what's been up with the two of you? Um, I've been making tons of music. Um, we've been doing this podcast. We're, we're working on a second podcast slowly uh, called Distant Stars. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I fucked off to the East Coast and lived on a boat for a little while. Nice. Yeah. And I just went down to the, uh, I went down to the Bahamas with, uh, with no experience in sailing and just went and worked on a boat for a while, sailed it up to Boston and... That was what I was doing for a couple months. I I mean, it sounds like it went well. Yeah, I I survived. That's <laughs> that's pretty much the high benchmark for sailing. It's like, like, and then they started trusting me with more and more shit to do, and it's just like I'm getting more and more responsibilities. And then like people are asking me after the fact, like, how did it go? Because they weren't on the boat that day. I'm just like, good, nobody died. And they were like, that is good. That's like, <laughs> that's like the most important thing. So good job, you did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it sort of makes me think of Andy Bernard from the office oh, yeah. and remember when he's on the boat and he tries to go it alone and then he drops all his shit overboard and <laughs> he's just sunburned and hungry and yeah. dehydrated exactly. so i'm like yeah. i'm thinking when you're saying i went down to the bahamas with no sailing experience i'm just imagining you just yeah <laughs> just like that i'm, I'm glad it didn't turn out that, that, that would have that would have been me if i wasn't surrounded by people who actually knew what they were doing fair jack at least has like his boat legs though because we used to go deep sea fishing with our dad yeah that's cool yeah ever caught any uh marlin uh no, no. the biggest ones we caught were dorado yeah and yellowtail yeah big old dorado i don't know what a dorado is it's a uh, mahi mahi Oh yeah, the big yeah. yellow, blue, green fuckers that look that are like the shape of a baseball bat. Okay, so it's not like um, it's not sort of orangish, triangular, maybe about this big, mm. crunchy. No, that would be a goldfish. <laughs> I was going more that, for a though, Dorito, but uh, <laughs> I was thinking the snack. This morning. <laughs> A Dorado made entirely of Doritos. Would you? Just, Dorito, a Dorito we, Dorado. Yeah. We just send Dur- Doritos onto the sea, just dump them in mass quantities, and they'll eventually become Doritos. Dorito the great, Island. <laughs> the Great Pacific Dorito Patch. What if it, what if, okay, we would have to make the Dorito Patch bigger than the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Yeah. So that it could consume it and just turn it into a delightful snack. Oh, and then the entire, and then we've also solved world hunger, two problems in one. That's bingo, bingo. smart. I mean, because you know, like pretty much any food you eat is necessarily going to have yeah. some icky stuff 
in it on yeah. like a particle level yeah so it's like you might as well it's like yes these doritos may be one to two percent ocean garbage yeah but i mean like, your body can handle one to two yeah. percent of ocean garbage I, it's Adam, not a coward adams go on forever so really like the finest filet mignon has just a teensy trace of shakespeare's defecation so amen dead yeah. insects are still allowed in a certain quantity in our food so we're eating bugs yeah, yeah. Bugs, yeah. hooves, yeah. like nails Oil from like plastic we ingest, probably. Okay, yeah. we actually did get into this topic uh, one very long day on the boat when we were sailing from Nassau to Boston. All the crew were talking over dinner was eventually, like, I mean, it, it already happens in other parts of the world, but eventually it's going to become mainstream as the demand for as like we try to figure out solutions for food shortages shortages that don't involve destroying capitalism because that's never going to happen uh uh-huh. we're eventually going to just resort to eating bugs yeah it already happens in other countries so we're probably going to adopt that solution in the next couple decades and then once once bugs become a cat uh become a cash livestock then we're going to start genetically engineering them to be bigger and bigger and bigger and then my contribution to the conversation most important thing a couple decades down the road cricket rodeo Hey, <laughs> you're going to be able to ride grasshoppers. You are going to need to be prepared, though, because at that scale, they can jump about three miles. Yeah, I was about to say that, like, I have. So- sorry about your chair, because I literally just shit my pants <laughs> thinking about a, a bull sized oh, yeah, cricket. That, that really <laughs> reeks, dude. Come hit, on. <laughs> hissing and jumping. Have you ever watched close up footage of, like, a grasshopper's mouth? machinations no but all I, like this horrible like garbage disposal grinder thing that just destroys grass imagine like something big enough that it that your entire head could fit inside it doing that i mean that sounds it reminds me of uh what is it peter jackson's king kong oh, remember yeah, yeah, when, all, when the big bugs I yeah was, i was i watched mystery science Theater, so i was thinking about the beginning of the me. end <laughs> Yeah. Fair. Mm. Although, okay. The one with the giant crickets. Yeah. Yeah. Real shit, though, on genetically engineering bugs. I was at Petco last night, just like looking at animals as one does. Yeah. And they sell genetically modified crickets, like for pet food. And it's like they're fortified with extra vitamins (laughs) and stuff. And I was like, this is bizarre. But yeah, we already have GMO live crickets. Yeah. Do they, so, do they look healthier? Do they look like they're they're living their best life with all those vitamin supplements living inside them? I haven't seen them up close, but I can only imagine they are. Yeah. But yeah. Their teeth are shinier. Also, they have teeth, which is weird. <laughs> just human teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath all those pincers and manifolds, there's just like opening up and there's Where are the cricket teeth? dentists? We need to be training people now. <laughs> you got to get through the first mouth to get to the second mouth and work on its human teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and he might, might bite your hand off. There's a 75% chance. There's a, there's close to a 100% chance that it'll bite your hand off. You're working with two very dangerous, very large, very powerful mouths. And like the, the turnover for cricket dentists is very fast because you can basically only do one job and then goodbye hands. <laughs> but it's a brave job. It's a brave job. And you know what it means for the economy is that there are always more jobs to fill. Yeah. Amen. God bless America. And thank God there's a company that makes super expensive replacement hands. It's just, it's synergy. It all works. Everything feeds into something else. It's called the invisible hand because that's what the dentist's hands (laughs) are after they're bitten off. The invisible hand of the market is just a a cricket dentist snub. (laughs) (laughs) Without cricket dentists, the the entire cycle of the economy falls apart. (laughs) <laughs> um, my friend Ariel, he told me there's um taco shop, I think in North Park, that you can order crickets at as a side. Uh, ha, see, it's already happening. Yeah. We I've just read ha- blogs from people in the U.S. who are eating them regularly. Yep. Now just American industrial farming has to get in on it, and then we will have giant bugs. Mm-hmm. When you think about it, I mean, thinking of like vegan and vegetarian activism, especially PETA, but pretty much any campaign that relies on like guilt and images that make you feel bad, it's going to be really hard for any of them, if they want to defend bugs, to do that for bugs. Because even unconventional, like, non-conventional, non-pet animals, like chickens and cows, 
the average person, they see a little calf or a little chick, they feel bad for it. It's cute. It's fuzzy. Because it's got big eyes. But yeah. giant crickets will also have very large yeah. eyes. Very true. But and very shiny. Soulless eyes. True. Black eyes. Have you heard about uh, lab-grown meat? I have heard of it, like, literally, but I know nothing about it. Yeah, um, it's pretty expensive right now. Probably, like, 1000 or $2,000 a pound. Jesus. <laughs> but... But it, the price is going to steadily go down, and I'm wondering what the vegan argument is going to be against eating uh, meat that's entirely grown in a lab. Like, no animal had to die for it. Like, it'll just be a matter of preference at that point. Yeah, one thing I have seen, actually, from a couple, like, as I said, I have heard of it. And part of why I've heard of it is because a couple vegan friends of mine have talked about it and being like, hey, this is a good idea. So... It'll be interesting to see not only how vegans argue against it, but just in general how the sort of vegan movement will fracture on that point and seeing why some vegans will support it and some won't. Yeah, some of them already differ in opinion about honey. And yeah, yeah. A different issue going off of going off of uh like lab grown meat that I'm that I'm concerned about is once nobody has any kind of moral argument against it what's to say what constitutes meat edible meat and what doesn't like i don't know if either of you guys have ever read a comic called transmetropolitan i think i might have brought it up on the show yeah you have but yeah i did and i think i brought it up for this exact point but i'm going to reiterate because it's relevant um like there's this massive global uh fast food fast food chain that's like superseded mcdonald's called uh called long pig (laughs) and since since lab grown meat is now a thing they can just grow huge factories full of human beings with no with nothing but a brainstem so that it's technically morally acceptable to eat human meat so long pig is just a fast food chain where you can go and get some tasty tasty human meat that does i mean they're right? they're not a lot they they were never alive so why is why is there any issue this is what happens when we stray from god's light <laughs> <laughs> amen and going going back to giant crickets like you know, right now, when you eat bugs, you basically every dish involving bugs, you eat the whole bug. Yeah. Like yeah. You just pick up a pick up a fried cricket and you eat it or, right. or whatever. Once they're giant, it'll be filleted like any other kind of meat. So you'll just be getting like a haunch, a, a grasshopper haunch. Although, do they have the, the, the same shell. amount of muscle as us? I don't know. You would have to crack open the shell like a crab, but I would assume that there's good meat underneath. Well, yeah, because that's what I was thinking. Because the difference between, say, a haunch mm-hmm. of a cow or a goat or whatever is that you got the bone and every. But you're with when you're dealing with an exoskeletal organism, it's gonna be like a cricket. Yeah, it's gonna be like cow portions, crab style. So you got to crack a shell <laughs> and then you just dig into a bunch of meat. That's a really good tagline <laughs> for a giant. Giant. Hey, it's sir. It's surf and turf all in one. <laughs> really, that's what yeah. we're getting at here. Well, I I read about eating crickets because I've been really curious about it. I wanted to order like some honey mustard crickets to snack on, but also, <laughs> um, I have a problem with shellfish. So and and they say like if you're allergic to shellfish, then like you, it's likely you'll be allergic to like the exoskeleton of insects as well. Right. Mm. So I've been reticent to try it, even though like I like the idea. You should try, I know I've seen it around, I think they call it either cricket meal or cricket flour. Oh, oh yeah, 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 I've, yeah heard I've heard about that. Yeah, but like, I'm not sure what the process is, but it may get rid of some of the allergens or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'll have to do my research on that. My guess is they would just like grind down whole crickets, so you still get like that part of the shell. Not sure. Okay. If we're going with like all kinds of giant bugs... What would be the best bug? Because we've talked a lot about crickets, you know, grasshoppers and shit, but I'm kind of thinking, like, giant worm. Wait, best for what? Best for eating. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't thinking. Like, I'm, I'm thinking you take home, a wor- like, like a good chunk of giant worm, and then you just kind of, like, cook it like a spiral cut ham. <laughs> <laughs> Only there's no bone you have to work around because it's a worm. Fair. Yeah. My... Some, like, honey glazed, honey glazed worm. Well, you're... Mention of glaze is one of my hesitations mm-hmm. because if you think of worm, at least earthworms, which yeah. I assume is what you're talking about, you're dealing with like the mucus surrounding the outside, true, which could be an unpleasant experience. I, I, would, ass- I would assume that they would remove the mucus during the processing, but would that not then dry out the meat? Oh, that's that, 
these are the problems that future that future bug farmers will have to work out or bug butchers. I don't know at what chain of production that would be that would be a concern. I think probably the butchers. Probably the butcher or perhaps the middleman, the slaughterhouse. Yeah, the, slaughter, the slaughterhouse. The, the packaging. Yeah. Either of those, they would have to clean like all the dirt off of worms, which would get tricky because like even if you clean them off, like they still kind of taste like dirt hole. Yeah. Well, in, in fact, well, and that's because they're so small, you can't really get a feel for the meat. They're so small. But Good point. We there wouldn't really even be a butcher in the in the in the chain here because we're talking about industrial farming. We're talking about like. It's going to a KFOs for bugs. It's going it's going <laughs> it's going to a massive bug slaughterhouse, which how would you how would you kill a worm like that? I feel like you would just have to freeze it and then hope it doesn't come alive until you cook it. Yeah, actually, because and then I gets, hadn't even yeah. thought of that. And but then it yeah. gets packaged and then it gets shipped to your local grocery store. Because it is one of those things when you cut it in half, both both yeah. still live. So they cut up the chunks of, of worm and then they freeze them and then they ship them out. And then you better hope to God they don't come unfrozen at any point before you before you cook them. Should I should I defrost the meat? No, no, <laughs> just put it in the oven right away. <laughs> put it in the oven and tie it down. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna wake up and it's gonna be mad. Mad? Uh, hey, the bug gets bigger, so does the brain. What if there were ants that were like twenty to fifty times the size? Not like gigantic, but like, like bigger ants that like, you could stack on, like the size like maybe- of a small dog. Okay, well, or sm- a so- soda can. I was thinking, like, are you talking soda can or Chihuahua or it's like like potato chip? Like, oh, like a potato potato a chip. Po- okay, because reminds- anything like soda can size and up is going to at least like take a piece off of your body. Yeah, yeah, easily. No ants the size of a potato chip. Would like, that still be dangerous to swallow? It'd be. Well, it'd it, be dangerous to be near if yeah. they're alive. If they were alive, and yeah. also consider since ants like always exist in large numbers. Potato, a single potato chip sized ant isn't much to worry about. But if you have, it'll, it'll bite off a chunk of you. But that's it. Yeah, but if you have a thousand potato chip sized ants, then you are just you're cl- clean white bones in about twenty seconds. Yeah, you so have you, to keep yeah. them really contained to grow them that size. Guys, I feel like I feel like we're writing like a really great nineteen fifties nineteen sixties B movie, and we should like. We should like get some black and white cameras and make this. <laughs> should hold ants up really close to the lens so they look. Oh yeah, no, potato no, chip no modern size. day special effects. It's all just shitty forced perspective. It'd be yes. really hard with the ants because they're so goddamn small. You would they every shot of them would be blurry because you'd have to get it that close. Hey, just that blurriness just makes it scarier. You don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> it leaves it leaves something to the imagination, and your mind your mind is the scariest part of it all. Yeah. Were you going to say something? About- uh, no, I just think if we go any further th- than this, it's going to devolve too much, which could be what we want to go for. But- I, who cares, man? We're, yeah. we're talking. You do raise a valid point, though. We've been talking about I'm, the risk of devolving is a risk indeed, since all we're talking about is evolving insects to a greater level of eatability yeah and then which we, we nobody might, is interested in this we, topic we probably. Might, uh there's at least two people at this table who are very interested in this topic <laughs> but if we evolve them to a certain level of eatability we might evolve them to a point where we're actually just evolving our own eatability to them that's a risk we got to take they escape the ant the ant farms and the cricket farms and they come for us they come for our blood you know what they i mean uh Without struggle, how will we be strong? A life devoid of conflict is a sad life indeed. We need enemies to keep us on our toes. And if our enemies are swarms of potato chip sized ants and crickets the size of cows, that's a risk we got (laughs) to take. And we got to look them right in their... Right in their compound eyes and say, "Hey, <laughs> cowards, we're not afraid of you." And then they just respond, <sighs> and then they and then they eat our arms. But somehow we're stronger for it. Yeah. yeah, what doesn't kill you makes you crying in a puddle of your own blood and intestines. Every America gets a compulsory M16. <laughs> <laughs> now for defending yourself against ants. Now we're getting now we're getting to a future that America can really get behind. Mandatory gun ownership, <laughs> industrialized farming, everything. Everything we stand for. And now I'm really glad that we had that we had the American flag in this in this week's picture. God bless America. And God bless 
damn these insects. <laughs> these giant ants. <laughs> that we created. <laughs> these giant ants. We of course we call them giant ants because like that is that is exactly what they are, but and comparatively to regular ants, they're gigantic. But when you say giant ants, people think like the size of a car. And Which they, they are. And not. then they see giant ants and they're just like they can still fit in the palm of your hand, but they take up the whole palm of your hand. Yeah, but a Which, potato chip in its own way is terrifying. Still alive could probably like pick up your foot and flip you over. Yeah. Oh but yeah. The I forgot strong. about how we strong forgot, they are. We forgot about the exponential strength. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. So Dude. if you had like the aforementioned one thousand, they'd tear your house from its foundations. <laughs> one. This one, is awful. <laughs> one little pincer on your foot. And they can just cut your foot in half. <laughs> and I've already established giant grasshoppers will be able to hop about three miles. They have every advantage on us, including numbers, because we farmed them. We farmed the shit out of them to feed our needs. Are, are butterflies just going to pick us up and drop us like 3,000 miles away? I hope not. I hope so. <laughs> Get a new life. That's that's the butterfly. in the Indian yeah. Ocean. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the butterfly effect, dude. We start by just genetically altering bugs, and then it ends with a butterfly dropping us thousands of feet above the, of the above the earth. It's that's I'm pretty sure that's what the butterfly effect is. Yeah, American yeah. Airlines will start commissioning butterflies once they get up to a certain size. Oh, we yeah, did you, it with passenger just, pigeons. You just you, yeah. I remember I remember back in the fifties when. We phased out planes for a little while in lieu of giant passenger pigeons. Yeah. Those were good times before they went extinct. And now in the 2050s, we'll do that with passenger butterflies. Yeah. But now they literally have passengers. Yep. We just strap a giant shipping container to their backs, fill it up with people. Idea, though. Because I'm thinking eatability. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to eat before you can fly. Right, so we got to get those logistics. That, that always covered. comes first. We 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 figure out the technology to make them potato chip size, then cow size, and then airplane size. It all goes in stages. Yeah, exactly. So first stage of eatability, though, we have to consider if potato chip sized ants are going to fuck our shit up, and we cannot allow this with the with your newly revealed information of their super strength. That and, would just... and again. They, the bug gets bigger, so does the brain, so they'll be able to organize more more complex plans. And they're already complex. Could, they're already complex organisms and organized probably Precisely, yeah. greater yeah. complexity or, than humans. Or what if they're they're actually on their our side because they're smarter and they smash the state? Well, hey. I mean, in this scenario, we're the ones, who, the ones who create Antarchy. Antarchy. <laughs> I mean, in this in this situation, we're the ones who created them through industrial farming, so they would want to kill us. And maybe they're smart enough to plan, but they aren't smart enough to distinguish one group of humans from another. So they just see all of us as the oppressor class and must be destroyed. Unless we make them so smart that they just get filled with feelings of ennui and existential despair and just are too <laughs> depressed to fight back oh that, and when now, we and when we thinking. when we industrial you know like sort of captive bolt their ant heads they're just <laughs> right. like we make them all low serotonin <laughs> right and yes. they're just like thank you yeah so so in order to maximize eatability of all insects we make them bigger we make them so intelligent that they can experience ennui and become debilitated by their own depression. We genetically engineer them to have as little serotonin as possible. And you know what? Just again, double down on eatability. Uh, how can we turn their blood into butter? Ooh. Ooh. And could they still survive? Are we talking cow butter, like cow dairy butter, or, or a special ant butter? Do uh, Which insects produce milk? None. <laughs> Okay, which you? <laughs> let's, let's, that's let's, a mammalian trait, yeah. <laughs> let's broaden it to like the almond milk kind of sense. Oh, what and what bug could be used to create a milk-like substance? I think, and then let's make butter out of that and replace spider ant, and replace ants' blood with it. Spider milk, Sp or Ooh, I think, spider milk. I think they spider actually, silk, spider milk. I think they actually are making cricket milk. Like, I'm not even joking. So they are the cows of this situation. Kind of, yeah. God damn. Wait, let me look that... Let me fact check real quick on... Is somebody in Silicon Valley just going to take our idea and run with it? I, I would hope first somebody from somebody from Hollywood takes this idea and runs with it, because I want to see this movie. <laughs> or both. 
Oh, both at the same time, yeah. Both at the same time. So so it becomes a hit movie right in time for it to become reality. Yeah. I One mean, after the other, bing, bang, boom. I mean, like the social network with Mark Zuckerberg. They made a movie about it, and then it became real. <laughs> Cockroach milk, question mark, from the Canadian <laughs> Global News Organization. <laughs> yep. Uh... Insect dairy alternatives could be the next superfood trend from R.T. Patel. So uh, it may not be everyone's cup of milk, but for years now, some researchers believe insect milk could be the next big dairy alternative. Thanks, Artsy. So you're welcome. Haha, <laughs> that's her. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so we could make milk out of anything. Exactly. And then we turn it into butter, and then we genetically modify ants to replace their blood with it. I like this. Yeah. Low serotonin, (laughs) hyper-intelligent, cockroach milk-filled ants. Depressed. Don't forget, extremely depressed. Right. This is foolproof. Easy Easy to do and foolproof. So... What if the ants become... Inti- We've already made them hyper-intelligent, but also hyper-depressed. What if they become intelligent enough to synthesize their own antidepressants? How, though? Because we haven't given them opposable thumbs. True, but they have mandibles, and they have they have large groups to work with. So I feel like three ants using just their pincer mouths and their, and their, and their legs together could form roughly the equivalent of one human hand. That's fair. What do you think, Ian? Um... <laughs> You're I, got, I got a terrible idea. <laughs> what Let's is it? hear it. Sing it, brother. Um. Well, well. First of all, they say exercise is the cure for depression. Right. So keep them in my wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so we're creating we're creating veal ants. Yes. <laughs> Can't let them stand up. Just gotta keep them bolted to the floor at all times. <laughs> And then wherever they stay, it's just a patch of dirt. No plants they could, like, boil down and try to make it to their own ant medications. Nope. You're they not going to have they're them. They're just intravenously fed. Yeah, they're just fed corn like the rest of our livestock. Do they, would ants eat corn? Ma- oh, no, they're, just, they're, that they're, size. they're just fed sugar water. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I like this idea. Wait, bolted down. Da- I just real <laughs> bolted down? <laughs> Like crucifying them to the floor. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to go, if you want, if you think, if you ascribe to the philosophy that cruelty makes them taste better, then yeah. But I, 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 would think, I would think more just like a metal bar across their abdomen, oh, and, then okay. bolt it, and then bolt that down so they can't get I, up. I was okay. thinking like a, a dog kennel cage that they could like kind of move around in, but they can't go for distance. <laughs> Very, I think that's a smart idea. Yeah, but then if they have the room to move around, then they'll, then they'll chew through the cage. Or. Even if they won't chew through the cage, what you're saying about exercise, they'll be able to do little ant push-ups and stuff. You get, you Ooh, gotta they're like, gonna get prison jacked. Yeah, yeah. you gotta keep them down. You gotta keep jacked. them down with their legs spread out so that they can't, <laughs> <laughs> so that they can't do anything except flail their six arms in futility. We're going to get a pita complaint just from this episode. <laughs> or use the metal bar to bolt the abdomen down, and then bolt each of the legs down individually, just with a bolt through crucifixion style. <laughs> Actually, you know what, guys? I'm getting I'm getting a little bit bored of the regular ants. We need to we need to get some variety in there. Could we do this also with uh, with giant fire ants and create sort of like a spicy variety? <laughs> <laughs> Tapatio fire ants. <laughs> oh yeah, fire ants brought to you by Tapatio. I think I think that could work. The one issue with experimenting with other ant species, though, is like since there's so many, where where does it stop? I would say it stops at bullet ants. Is are they like bullet ants and then it stops or it stops right before bullet ants? I would say ants? it stops right before bullet ants. Okay. Uh do you guys do you guys know about bullet ants? Yeah. Yeah. Or do they're, you Ian? They're uh remind me. They're ants. They're about they're a little bit bigger than an average ant, maybe about like, like a little smaller than the last two digits of my pinky. Yeah, I've always so, heard about the size of a thumb. Yeah, so pretty pretty big, pretty big ants. And they tend to drop out of trees, and then they bite you. And uh, 
I don't know what madman came up with this with this scale with this ranking system, but oh, they yeah. are the, they are the number one uh, ranked painful insect bite in the insect bite index. Number one most painful. They're called bullet ants because it feels like getting shot when they bite you. So I, I think, don't I don't think we need to make those any bigger because I feel like they could probably rip open a tank. Yeah, yeah, and no, and bees and wasps are off the table. Well, what about bumblebees, the ones that don't have stingers? No, not even bumblebees. No. But they're so, they're already so big and fat. Well, maybe they could be in zoos, but and, I wouldn't want to eat them. And they're fuzzy too, well, so yeah, you can, you can use their you can use their pelts. You can get a giant bumblebee <laughs> fur coat. <laughs> well, see, that's where I think we do run into where PETA and other animal rights campaigns could effectively argue against it because people I just I mean, this is uh, anecdotal experience. I can't cite any studies here, but a lot of people I know, the bug they like best are bees. Like bees have their little furry bodies mm-hmm. and they pollinate flowers. They're kind of cute. They're not mm-hmm. like crickets or cockroaches or ants. Yeah, but so, what if they were huge? <laughs> that's a good point. It makes me think of like the SpongeBob episode where the butterfly lands on SpongeBob's Oh, helmet. and then they see it up close it's like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah. But then we're back to the giant butterflies, which we're, we've already established we're not going to eat. We're just going to use for transportation and maybe to fight Godzilla. Because I feel like if we go down this road of genetically modifying animals, we're going to create a Godzilla yeah, sooner or well, later. Well, the butterfly- we're going to need the giant butterflies, or more accurately, the giant moths to fight him. A, bu- a butterfly fact is they don't live that long. So like once the butterflies die from like two plane trips, yeah. then we... we Probably should eat them. Then we then we mulch them down and feed them to the other bugs. Oh yeah. Hey. See, it's a perf. We've worked out a perfect system, guys. Yeah. But and no more jet fuel. Yeah, no more jet fuel. You just, just nectar. Yeah, you just just nectar. <laughs> and if we create giant bees, we'll have unlimited nectar. <laughs> and, uh, how do you not see how this works? Should do. Okay, giant I'm kind of coming around now. I it's just a, hate bees. It's a perfect cycle. The bees create the create the the bees pollinate, so we get more nectar to feed the butterflies. The butterflies fly, and then they get mulched down and fed to the crickets. The crickets, <laughs> I don't know, it's some, the crickets. Oh, the crickets create the milk that gets put into the, into the ants, <laughs> and then the ants uh, we just eat, and then the ants we eat, so that we have the energy to raise more giant bees, and we film a sequel to Ants, the movie, <laughs> this time without Woody Allen. <laughs> Ants too, and it's just a bunch of ants bolted to the floor, <laughs> being slaughtered and eaten. Sponsored by PETA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, guys, I think we've solved all of the world's problems. Let's count them off. First off, it was the Doritos. So we got we we, we solved we solved the giant Pacific garbage patch. Then with ge- with genetically modified bugs, we solved. Let's see, world hunger, uh, zero emissions because we can just use bu- uh, we can just use uh, butterflies for flight. And you know what? Caterpillars replace cars and trains. So every stage of its life cycle is helping us trans- with transportation. We just put giant caterpillars on tracks and everybody rides them. It's got a bunch of saddles on it. So no no transportation emissions or anything like that. Uh, we I, I think I said we already solved world hunger. We, we could get these huge bugs to fight our wars for us. True. That's what guys. I was uh, just a second ago. I was thinking we created like some kind of utopian future, but I think we may have just stumbled into like a prequel to Starship Troopers. Yeah, so maybe it doesn't stop at bullet ants. Maybe we <laughs> maybe can... we just maybe human greed just keeps going until we create super bugs that kill us and then take over and become a bug planet and then a bunch of and then Casper Van Dien has to go and shoot at him. I gotta say, what, that's what not giant a bad bug feature. would you guys want as a pet? Oh, something that couldn't bite. Probably, um, hmm. Something, let's see. Well, okay. So, you know how, uh, like when pigs are really small, they're really cute? Yeah. yeah. Like little, little teacup pigs? Mm-hmm. Even, even though that's a myth and they're all just baby pigs and they all grow up to be huge? Yeah. Uh, and you know how I earlier compared a, a section of delicious giant worm meat to a spiral cut ham? Mm hmm. So, what if. You kept like an adorable little baby worm that's about the size of your arm. And then as it gets older, uh, you kind of like move it out to the backyard and kind of keep it there and just kind of let it roll around in its food trough. And then eventually it transitions from pet to food. And you just kind of you just kind of eat your giant worm. I mean, people you have a giant freezer full of worm meat for the next couple of years. People in the Midwest would be up for that. But I think we need to like 
pick what bugs are going to be pets and which are going to be food because yeah. people have that with say a dog versus a cow. Yeah. Well, I want to raise my beloved blue ribbon winning giant worm. I'm going to take him to the state fair and he's going to get the blue ribbon. <laughs> and then when he gets old and gray figuratively, you you're going to take him out to pasture. I'm going to take him I'm going to take him out to pasture with an axe and I'm just going to chop up all the chunks. I'm going to bring all the wriggling, still living chunks back and put them in the freezer. <laughs> Except for one. I'm going to grill that up for for the family to celebrate. I'm going to have a whole barbecue for the whole fam. You guys are invited, of course. Oh, thank you. We're all, we're all going to be there. We're all going to have a, we're all going to have a nice piece of slimy. Mm. His, his name is slimy. He's not, he's not actually slimy. He has, he has good texture. I raised him right. I'll make sure to Facebook RSVP to that. Yeah. yeah. I fed him like top notch dirt. Hell Yeah. <laughs> If if I had a okay, so when we say giant, are we talking like potato chip ant giant, or are we talking cow cricket giant? Um, well, since it's pets, like think in the cat to dog range. Definitely not a house fly. There's a house fly in the little recording studio, and it's that we're trying to that, kill that would eat. be that would be less like a pet, like a house pet, and more like a horse. You would keep that around and be like, all right, yeah, and the then it's like. <laughs> <laughs> it would fly you off places. I'm too disgusted you, you, by house flies yeah, to ride them yeah. like a horse. Though. When you don't have time to go to the airport and get on a butterfly with a hundred other people, you just you just hop on your own house fly and it flies you around town. I actually did it. That's wow. impressive. Yeah, Ian just fucking murdered the house fly. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy to get the big ones. You usually have to use a fly swatter, but I just use two fingers. Yeah, he was on top of my water bottle. The big ones are easier to catch. You just gotta be like. Whoop. So I'm just I'm like legitimately impressed. Not even you, you've joking. Ne- you've here. never you've never killed a fly with your bare hands before. No, pussy. Yeah, you're right. So, so my te- city folk over here never killed a fly with his bare hands. My my technique here was I had crept my hand up to the water bottle lid slowly so he wouldn't sense it. His eyes were pointing in the opposite direction, and then I pounced like a cat. Like I was gonna say, like a like a tiger yeah. on a well, wild, a, on kind, a, a kind of cat on a little pig. Yeah. What happens? <laughs> what happens when these industrial, genetically modified giant bugs get out? Like, eventually, they're going to break out from somewhere. Somebody's going to forget to leave something locked. We're going to have a Jurassic Park situation. They're going to run free. What happens when these giant bugs en masse enter an ecosystem? Uh, they're going to fuck it up, <laughs> and that's just a reality we have to face. Yeah. But consider. How much do you actually like ecosystems? As Fuck they are ecosystems. Now? They're, they're We've kinda... already driven so many species that's like extinct yeah. already. Yeah. Or here's here's the alternative: because they're livestock and because they've been livestock for generations, they have no survival instincts. So it's sort of like releasing a domesticated pig into like the jungles of Sri Lanka. It's gonna get fucking <laughs> a, t- by a, by a tiger by a snake. Just, a tiger's just gonna destroy that thing. So I'm thinking maybe. They would go out there and have no fucking idea how to care for themselves in the wild. And then the wild animals would just feast on them. And then... Thereby causing population booms in those ecosystems. Yeah. And then and then we got and then we got tigers and hyenas running all over the place. Just, Which is not a good thing. Everything up. No matter how you scratch it, we ride high for a little while and then we end the world. Either by population booms in tigers or by the or by all the insects getting loose. One way or another, we are all gonna die. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah. Ever heard of a little of a little uh, guy named the Permian Extinction? <laughs> the earth has seen chaos before the earth will continue to see chaos. I, I say if our world gets ravaged by A, millions of tigers, <laughs> or B, insects destroying every ecosystem known to man, at least on land, yeah. I, I say that's a that's a risk. I mean, it's not a risk. It's going to happen. Yep. But that's okay. It's sort of, we're at peace with that. Okay. We're at peace with that. The benefits outweigh the consequences. The giant ants, get, the giant ants get out. Here's my here's my number one tactic to stop them. Okay. We because again they've been raised in captivity, they have no no instincts for how to survive in the wild. They don't know what the ocean is. They just mm. know that it's a big body of water. So we get just all of the sugar that we have and we dump it into the ocean <laughs> and all the ants are just like sugar water and they just run straight into the water and then they drown. 
Because have you guys ever seen an ant drown? They will drown in just like a thin film of water across yeah. the surface. They will they will totally die in the ocean. I think I would drown too because uh, once you put sugar in the ocean, you get that sweet and salty <laughs> oh, combination. Yeah. It's, and it's I sweet, can't resist it's so that. Good. It's like, have you ever had those chocolate covered potato chips? It's, yeah. It's so wrong and yet it's so right. Yeah. So, I mean, count me in in the, in <laughs> and the aquatic make the death toll. the fish t- taste better too if we still have them around in well, 2050. Well, then we have the problem of diabetic fish. Uh, I mean, hey... What do you mean, problem? <laughs> <laughs> They're slow. They need their insulin. They just, you don't even have to catch them. They just float to the top when they, when they go into a diabetic coma. Exactly. Although it does, there are some insects and just bugs in general, I guess, that live in and around the water. Mm-hmm. And I'm just here thinking of hordes of giant ants ravaging farmland and stuff. But what would sand the, flies? Yeah. What, but what would the aquatic ecosystems be like? Well, I mean, there's certain species of like bugs, I mean, like you know, flies and spiders that uh, that can like stand on water. Yeah, yeah. Like they can they can stand across the surface tension of the water. I don't know if that would carry over once they got huge. Good like, point. Depending on how well they spread out their body. <laughs> and just and, spanning miles across the ocean. And they are the new fairy to Hawaii. These, these would have to be these would have to be like Lovecraftian sized bugs for this to work. <laughs> Although then really it becomes an exponential problem because the bigger they get, the more they have to spread out, and the more they spread out, the bigger they have to get. So you really can't win. Maybe so, you could just form artificial islands on the backs of their exoskeletons. Oh, here's another thought. Just just continent sized daddy long legs, and because again their legs are, those daddy's legs are so long. Uh, mm. They can just stand in the ocean and carry things on their backs. <laughs> oh, I'm liking this. You just like build a house on a giant daddy long legs and he carries you around the ocean. Although you know how they say daddy long legs aren't that dangerous because their mouths are too small to bite mm. a human. Yeah. I don't know if that's an urban legend or not. I, I've, I have also heard that they have like a super deadly bite, but they just can't get through our skin. Yeah. So like, let's say this is true. Let's just bracket this as fact for right yeah. now. Let's just... Let's just uh, Labor under the assumption that it is true, because it's probably going to be funnier. Once we make them continent-sized, they're going to fucking kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> well, at that point, you really don't even have to worry about the venom, because if, it, if it You gets... make daddy long legs super muzzles. <laughs> <laughs> at that, when they get to that size, you don't even need to worry about the venom payload, because just as soon as they get their pincers on you, you're dead. While true, that still s- sucks. Yeah, that's pretty risky. Yeah. I'm saying, like, at that point, it doesn't it doesn't really matter if they did have a deadly bite to start with or not, because now they have a deadly bite just from sheer crush strength. What if you have? What if you're like one of those bosses in a JRPG that has 100 percent crush damage resistance, <laughs> and you need to switch to like daggers and spears so you can effectively fight it? So what if we put on like an amulet of crush resistance, and that way it has to. It has to use piercing or slash damage, which it can't because it's a coward that only knows how to use crush. I think I've solved the problem. I think you have, yeah. All right, so we so we've come up with great ideas and yeah. we've solved the problems that would arise yeah. from them. We've we started with solving the world's problems. We transition into creating a great B movie, and now we're creating a JRPG. And I think, guys, I think we did it. Is this a podcast or a think tank? It's a think tank, but we record it and put it on the internet. Hell yeah. So that people with actual initiative can act on these ideas that we have. Cowards. Intellectual takeout. You can have this one. (laughs) At Cato Institute, uh, what's the libertarian's take on giant ants that you (laughs) bolt to the floor and make depressed? As soon as you mention the prophet, the... uh, Jacobin weighing whether it works under socialism. The the libertarian... Yeah, the li- once you once the libertarian hears about the profit margins, he's just gonna pass out from all the blood rushing to his penis. So hell yeah. So I think we have the libertarian's answer on this. <laughs> what would be some great recipes for bugs? Because I, wa- I we all know this is the inevitable future. So let's just come up with a cookbook for bugs right now, like giant bugs mm-hmm. recipes that we literally can't do until there are giant bugs. We're just gonna have to hold on to them. Hmm. Well, yeah, that the ant potato chips would just have like standard flavors like barbecue, salt and vinegar, <laughs> sour cream and onion, all those. Yeah. Um, mm. For for dinner recipes, that's more your territory, Jack. Yeah. What I'm wondering is, 
Uh, could you do anything with the exoskeleton at that point, or would it be like shellfish and you would just have to discard it? I'm thinking like the, the exoskeleton you, was is edible at the small scale. I don't know about the yeah large at scale. the large scale. I'm wondering would it just be like would it just be like a lobster shell, or would it be with how strong it is? Would it just be like broken glass? Who knows? But if it is even remotely edible, then I would say uh, use the whole thing. Take off the uh, the exoskeleton in chunks and like create a nice dip. And then, like maybe, maybe it isn't like chips, but maybe it's more like a, it's more like artichoke leaves, where you just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you just like dip it, and then you scrape all the good stuff from inside, and then you throw away the shell. Or to to make f- even fuller use, like I like this, yeah. But to make even fuller use, you can do a sort of potentially long term marination of the exoskeleton, mm. soften it soften. up, you break gotta, you, it you got, down. You, you, vinegar's got to be a part of that marinade because oh, yeah. you got to have that acid to break through and soften it up. No, definitely. Uh, and so you have this lemon nice vinegarious, lemony, yeah, and whatever other flavors you want to put in. And it's just this sort of soft exoskeleton. We'd have to make sure it doesn't break apart into a liquid. But yeah. So we're, we're basically creating like a lutefisk situation where mm-hmm. it's like the fish bones become gelatinous. We're creating, we're creating a dish where the exoskeleton becomes gelatinous. Lutabug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, shit. I, no, I can't come up with a good ant based lutefisk pun. We could we could definitely also, just in terms of recipes, take a cue from Fallout New Vegas and you know, because it has a survival skill where you can make all the different stuff. So like ant meat is an item you can harvest from dead giant ants. So look at look so just Fallout look at, stole our ideas. Yes. We need to we need to sue Beth Asda. And Obsidian Entertainment. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> we're coming for you. Anyway, you were saying? Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, like, look at what they do with ant meat in the game. Maybe you could mix it with some, I don't know, barrel cactus fruit. All right. And let's see. What about a cricket's eyes? Like, you know, the big, the big fucking compound eyes. They would be roughly they'd be roughly meatball sized at this at this scale, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what? you just you just pop those out, saute about ten or twelve of them with some onions and some garlic, mm. some seasonings, make some pasta and some sauce, and you just you just eat bug eyes. A separate idea I just had cicada orchestras. C- cicada orchestra. Oh yeah. Oh, you, you tra- I like this. You train their ears so like they can they could scream different pitches, and then you go to the orchestra <laughs> yeah. and see cicadas. Yeah. And we can't we can't kill them. We can only use them for entertainment. But like, you just create an amphitheater and you bury a bunch of cicada larvae, and then every ten years they just come up and scream in perfect harmony, and it's gorgeous. I'm the new death metal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much down for this. Yeah. Are there any other bugs? It's, one, that it's make once noise. every ten years, so it's like a black tie affair. You got to mm-hmm. go there and you just watch the bugs burst up from the earth and scream. Two hundred dollar <laughs> tickets, <laughs> of course. Champagne and everything. I'm gonna pregame in the parking lot because even a, even at a classy affair, I'm gonna pull shit like that. But I'll still have champagne when the, when the time comes. Would this champagne be made with bug juice? Ooh, actual bug juice. I now I'm now I'm liking this idea. Yeah. Could oh, you ferment bug juice to create an alcohol? Fermented grasshopper milk. Yeah. I mean, there's this um. Mongolians drank fermented milk. How they didn't just make cheese, I'll never know, but they did. Yeah, I was going to say, like, there's uh, one of the national dishes, I think, of Kazakhstan is kumis or something. Anyway, Mm. but it's fermented mare's milk, and it's this mildly alcoholic thing that whenever you enter someone's home, traditionally, they offer you a bowl of kumis. Mm. And um, I think it's like 3 to 4% ABV, really not strong, but I mean, it doesn't have to be strong. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so like cricket kumis. Yeah, cricket kumis. <laughs> I'm very I'm very down for this. Cricket kumis at the at the what would it be? Deck annual? The, what yeah, would you call it the deck annual the de- cicada? The, the deck annual burst and scream. Yeah, Cic- well, cicada orchestra. It, it cicada only, concerto. It would only be every ten years at specific venue, so you could have like a hundred of these venues across the country and, hey. and stagger them so that there's like one every year on a perfect cycle. Would it be across the country or across the globe? Ooh. Would this be an international affair? Yeah. UNESCO sort of. Uh, there's a London cicada <laughs> philharmonic. I would travel for the Red Rock Amphitheater cicada concert. <laughs> I know you could do it sort of like 
how people used to follow or still follow around, I guess, fish, you know, PH, yeah, yeah, yeah. fish and the Grateful fish Dead. Ads, yeah. yeah. And how they just follow around in their musty vans. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could do that, but with the bursting cicadas. <laughs> <laughs> And you Why have the, the hell not the cicada heads. <laughs> uh, we well, just come up with all the best ideas. You don't want to know what these beads are made of. <laughs> <laughs> On the notion of like dead heads, but with bursting, screaming cicadas, how would like hallucinogens work when you're surrounded by giant insects? Uh, you would go insane and shit yourself. That's how they would work. That's fair. Or they'd be just like super great. Who knows? Maybe once that once giant insects have become normalized and it's not a weird thing. Yeah, just then you cool. see it. Then while you're just tripping shit on acid, you just see a giant cricket and you're like, hey, whatever. <laughs> and then you put your hand way too close and it eats your hand, but you're just you just don't even care. But then you remember back a century ago when the first pioneering cricket dentists were <laughs> making yeah. that very same risk. Uh, what about like? If there are insects that insides are mildly toxic, once we blow them up, are those going to become new drugs? Maybe. I mean, hell yeah. Maybe. I, would, I would not be surprised. And also, though, when we blow... Hmm. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, what is it? The uh... <sighs> Like, there's a type of DMT that comes from, uh, like, a, a toad. Yeah, yeah. yeah the toad let's, let's not let's not branch out into giant toads because then they they eat all of the bugs and then we just completely destroy our livestock. <laughs> Can't have competition. Okay, we haven't brought this insect up yet, but call me crazy. I think dung beetles would be delicious. Why is that? I mean, I know they have a bad reputation being being the dung beetle and all, but you guys know what foie gras is, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. basically, dung giant dung beetle would be the foie gras of of giant bugs. Why? I mean, isn't foie gras basically a basically a goose that's uh, that's fed to death and eats just absolute shit until it becomes fat and dies? Well, yeah, but not literal shit. <laughs> oh, I was misinformed. What is what is a foie gras goose fed? Like just like concentrated fucking bread and stuff like that i think ah. definitely not feces <laughs> well hey what does a dung beetle eat besides its own shit that the shit would consist of mostly just like like straw plants and plant matter yeah so it's it's all organic it's all organic shit so that's true i'm not eating the shit i'm eating the bug that's grown fat on its own shit i think it would be a very i think it would be a very tender meat I think you'd have to, you would have to rebrand, though. I mean, of course like, you would. You can't call it Dung Beetle Foie no. Gras. No, no, no. Yeah, you, no no part of that is, is getting into the marketing. We'd have to call it, like, we'd have to call it Dungos. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you brand it so thoroughly that everybody forgets it was ever called a Dung Beetle, everybody's just like, mm, you, man, he, Dave sure can cook a Dungo. <laughs> I know, right? I always come over when he's cooking dungo on Fridays. <laughs> are, are there going to be like insect eggs that become the new caviar? Good question. Like you wouldn't have to blow them up as much, or like what whatever like insect we decide on, they wouldn't have to be as big as the meat type. Yeah, because like the, the eggs would just need to be slightly larger. Yeah. Uh. Well, I mean, like three times the size. Well, maybe bigger. They would, they would need to be bigger. Like fi- like caviar is fish eggs, which are like, they're like, yay big. They're yeah. like they're like about half the size of a of a pea. They're like so. little bobas. Yeah, they're like mini bobas. So they would need to be several several magnitudes larger than they are in their insect variants. So like, if we make the twenty times larger ants, then twenty times larger ant eggs would probably work as yeah as ant caviar. Mm-hmm. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Pill bugs are bowling balls now. <laughs> oh fuck yeah! Still alive, just just staple them so that they stay shut. Drill three holes in. <laughs> God, <laughs> that's horrible. Hey, hey, or don't... that's where I draw the line: <laughs> crucifying <laughs> ants and making Trapping them hyper them intelligent and depressed. Lives. All right, let me let me correct let me course correct here. You don't staple them shut because they need to be able to unfold so they can walk themselves back to you. But you do still drill holes in them. Well, that's okay. Yeah. And then you train them, mostly through abuse, to uh, to roll back up into a ball. 
at on command and oh stay God. in a ball while you stick your hand while you stick your three fingers into into its holes that you've drilled into its body and then roll it down. So you have slime on your fingers once you throw the volleyball. And you cauterize the wound, so they're they're dry holes. Oh, okay. You probably chalk them too, so your sweat doesn't get in there. Well, yeah, and here's the thing. I'm thinking, unlike our ants, these the pill bugs aren't going to be hyper intelligent. No, they're going to be dumb I, as shit. But yeah, they will be able to understand. Unfurl now. Don't unfurl now. That's. And I think, but other than that, I don't think they can conceive of suffering. I think it's exactly. more just like exactly. stimulus. Exactly. So I'm fine. Yeah, and may- maybe a lot of these insects won't really want to rise against us because they feel nothing, or just because they're super depressed, like the ants. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's good to single out the ants so they can't even sympathize with any of their other insect brethren because all the other insect brethren are still just operating at the insect level. It's just the ants. So we make them feel even more alone in the world, yep. thus ensuring their depressed docility. God, I really, oh, I really want to see ants make film now. Like, I, I think they, I think ants could turn out some really great film noir. A new wave of nihilist literature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've we've created we've created an, a hyper intelligent class of nihilist super ants. <laughs> that's how they co instead of doing any material action or like throwing bricks or killing anyone the way they cope with their oppression is just through literature and And smoking in the bathtub yeah so it's like it's a perfectly safe way Mm -hmm. we won't censor them we'll let them write what they want because ultimately their words are flaccid and can't be used against us because we know they have no motivation to actually rise up against us. At at this point, like, cigarettes are going to be banned for humans in every country. Cigarettes are just going to be made for giant insects. Yeah. And they'll be able to smoke six at a time. Yeah. That... Dude, that's bad. Dude, I'm I'm concerned about the issue of of the growing problem of lung cancer and super ants. That would... Lung cancer and emphysema are really just killing off the super ant population. And they don't even care. They don't care. They just keep smoking. And here's the thing, actually. We're still eating these ants. Yeah, so the nicotine could end up in us. Well, which is not a bad thing. I mean, the nicotine... It, it, would, it would create a nice smoky flavor. Nicotine is a great drug. It's like... does so many nice things. It's, yeah. the, it's the side effects of, like, of tobacco consumption that's oh, yeah. bad. But nicotine by itself... You know, yeah, like, like when it's you're pretty smoking, bad. you're inhaling carbon monoxide. Right? Yeah, yeah, but like just pure nicotine is pretty badass, and I'm not even joking. Like, yeah, they they have nicotine, um, uh, like amide something. We have a supplement that has like a different version of nicotine. That yeah, my mom was taking for a bit because it's one of those things. Like it increases attentiveness, increases serotonin production, etc. So oh, actually, no. <laughs> it would increase serotonin in the ants and then they'd be able to rebel. So <laughs> smoking frees the ants. <laughs> so actually, yeah, what we need to do is create an opioid epidemic uh, <laughs> among the go. ants. We got to we, we got to get them hooked on oxy. <laughs> <laughs> so just prescribe them. <laughs> Tell them it'll numb the pain and then they'll say something to the effect of I'm already numb and then they'll just take the pills anyway and then we got them. <laughs> They're <laughs> Well, if they're that if they're that edgy about it, then <laughs> we've we've created some very edgy ants. Let's be real here. This, very this is going to create so many jobs, like ant doctors, ant doctors to who are just like it's, it's butterfly it, airplane technicians. There's there's greater job security as an ant doctor than there is as a cricket dentist. <laughs> very true. <laughs> I think cricket dentist would be like the underwater welder of this oh, future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. What if Okay. There's there's the problem factory farming you have to produce lots of these bugs in order to keep up with demand. Yeah. They are probably not going to mate sufficiently in sufficient numbers on their own. So, I think the worst job, maybe not the most dangerous job, but definitely the worst job is going to be artificial bug inseminator. Yeah, I was going to say, well, it'd be queen inseminator. Oh, true. Cuz they're all Actually, it's weird. I was just researching this is related i promise i'm giving a lecture called memes in society today late october at palomar college um but one of the things i've been doing to prepare for it is what is society beyond the fact that we live in one gang we'd rise up 
Yeah. But like, <laughs> what is and so going through society, social organization. One of the thing Wikipedia articles I stumbled across today was EU sociality, uh, EU sociality, mm-hmm. and it's like how ants organize and bees organize. And one of the things about EU sociality is that there's very uh, stratified and organized sexual reproduction. So you only have like the one reproductive female. And then just a handful of reproductive males. Mm -hmm. So when dealing with artificial insemination, in this case, you know, with cows, you go from cow to cow to cow. With this, you just have to keep going back to this ant queen or whatever else. And it makes you wonder, like, how would that repeated and sustained interaction work? Because you can't just kill her off. But it's just the the one individual ant. So unlike a lot of other parts of factory farming, where you just have part of... Just a what, horde of them that, yeah, you, that you handle. Yeah, and part of what makes factory farming sort of like able to be so is that there isn't that real connection between mm-hmm. the slaughterhouse workers and the animals because there's just so much of them. But dealing with the queen, it's the same queen you're going back to. And mm-hmm. so if she's hyper-intelligent too... Oh. She might try and start trying to convince... Well, okay, actually, let me stop this here. Are they capable of symbolic communication? Well, I mean, they're they're nihilists, so they, they have complex thoughts. So I would assume that they would be able to, in some fashion. Can they communicate these complex thoughts to us? Hmm. Is that's, the microphone that's, okay? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I thought it was. It just looked like it was placed at a weird angle. Maybe, okay. maybe they I would learn. Maybe they would learn to chitter in Morse code. So as long as the the artificial ant inseminator doesn't know Morse code, yeah. Now, we're now we're walking into sort of a, a shape of water type concept where the artificial inseminator for the queen keeps going back, and they develop their own their own form of communication and create a mutual understanding, and then and then Michael Shannon gets mad. I don't know where Michael Shannon would factor into this, but I assume he would be mad. He about this. is the artificial inseminator. <laughs> this time, this time he's not the angry bad guy. This time he's this time he's the love interest. He falls in love with the queen, yeah. and then they and then they break him out. Of, all, all the break her out. Yeah, from like this first like twenty years of having giant insects, they would be so original and groundbreaking. Oh, dude, we we uh, both episodes of the podcast that we've had you on, we've created an, an intense, sprawling cinematic universe. This time, I feel like it's more it's more condensed and more focused it's all around these giant bugs but i kind of like the last one where we uh where like christopher columbus was a demiurge and england lost its capability of language and we factored in like minions and the dc universe and star wars we per- took all of it in perhaps but this, this one is, could this one is more be... narrow it's more focused i kind of like it. it runs cleaner Perhaps there could be some interaction between these two lores. I'm not saying Are you complete s- crossover. But like a, like a tease. Like, yeah. Like Easter egg crossover. Sort of like how... I don't think we could keep England degenerating into like the Morlock people. <laughs> right, right. But, but just having Christopher Columbus as the Demiurge, Ooh, that can if, cover both, just, both it's, lores. We just put it in an Easter egg in all these giant bug movies. Like they go, they go into like the giant beehive for all, where we're keeping all of the all the bees and in the back there's just like a yellow beeswax statue of Christopher Columbus and somebody's <laughs> like oh man we should turn that tear that down and like what why it's 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 heritage <laughs> <laughs> also he's he's he controls the universe <laughs> I don't know why, but I thought you were going to say just like a, j- a JPEG of Christopher Columbus <laughs> shittily superimposed onto oh, the movie. Oh, no. I, that, when we're like four or five movies in, we get really lazy with the Easter eggs. And we just we just put a pixelated, j- super enlarged JPEG of of whatever we want an Easter egg in, just, and just tape it to the wall in the background of a scene. That's that's how lazy we get by like the fifth movie. Do we allow um, the smartest giant insects access to social media and Photoshop so they can make new memes? Oh, that's a good question. Like, it, it falls into the same scenario of like millennial interns doing like running company, twi- running like corporate Twitter accounts and churning out all those all those hot, hot, super ironic memes and now it's it's ants creating super ironic deconstructionist memes about their own oppression, and it's like 
It could kind they're of selling placate them, them if they have something to laugh about. Yeah, they're, re- they're placating themselves. They're 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 also like making light of their own oppression, so we feel less guilty eating them. Yeah, I think I think we shouldn't allow them direct access to social media. Instead, what we should do is give them access to computers, yeah, so they can make the memes, and then we have a human censor yeah. go through the memes, filter which are acceptably sort of snarky, ironic, complaining about their oppression. Maybe, and which maybe, ones... ju- maybe just dark enough that people believe that it's genuine. Yeah, and, the, and then filter out the ones that are just flat out, obviously, cries information for help. warfare. Yeah, they're just yeah. cries for help. Or yeah. like carefully coded memes just telling you where and when to come and break them out. Yeah, so we gotta, we gotta get those out. We gotta, we gotta filter those out, but they'll yeah. get more and more clever over time, and one of them is gonna get through. The only question is whether or not there are any, there are any benevolent humans on the other side who will be able to understand through the through the several layers of meme to to understand what they're trying to convey and i do think it it wouldn't be smart to take a totalitarian approach and say like okay in that case with what you're saying with ants inevitably getting through one might be tempted to say okay in that case no no meme making ability for the ants but i feel like it's one of those things you got to balance because if you don't let them make the memes if you mm-hmm. don't let them self express the, they're just going to get even more angry. Yeah. So yeah. with the sensor, yeah, agree. Yeah, you don't yeah. you don't crack you don't, <laughs> yeah. you don't crack down. You just pull the classic move. You pull some marketing judo so that anything anything that is radically against your brand becomes a part of your brand. Exactly. And I think so. I think using the cultural logics of late capitalism uh, <laughs> in regards to ants complaining about their oppression is something that would be extremely effective because you just rehabilitate once the truly uh, you know, just cry for help sort of memes start getting through the censors. Right. As you said, inevitably, it doesn't matter because we've defined a cultural logic at that point that will just immediately rehabilitate and assimilate those cries for help <laughs> into this hyper ironic post yeah. post postmodernist yeah. by sort that, of by that humorous point, that cricket shit posting. <laughs> by, the, by the point by the point that those cries for help pass the human meme Turing test, then They'll be they'll be diluted by so many layers of ironic detachment that they'll be that they will be just imperceptible from a regular meme. So there really is no escape for the ants. No wonder they experience so much ennui. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. <laughs> We've created a solution to world hunger and yet still turned it into a capitalist hellscape. And a hit new cinematic universe about giant bugs. What you it, guys. what you call a capitalistic hellscape, I call some some darn tootin' good investment opportunities. Oh yeah, God bless America. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. What was the what was the name of the uh, what was the title of the lecture that you were giving? Yeah, uh, it's going to be called Memes and Society Today. Cool. I would like to hear more about that, not in the context of the giant bugs. Yeah. Um, so outside of the context of the giant bugs, I. So for context, I gave a lecture last year mm-hmm. call at the at Palomar College. For any listeners who don't know, it's in this North County, uh, in North County, San Diego, San Marcos, California, Palomar mm-hmm. College, and so I gave a lecture last October called. Anarchy, Antifa, and the Modern Radical Left, where I was pretty much explaining what is... And I, I actually said in the lecture it'd be better titled Anarchism, Antifa, <laughs> and the Modern Radical Left, but anarchy sounds snappier. Uh, but I, Antarchy. <laughs> Sorry, I said I'd leave the giant insects out of this. Continue. It's it's very fair (laughs) but uh yeah so i just went through and pretty much was explaining especially because antifa was so in the zeitgeist last year right uh, right around that time i just wanted to explain as a former anarchist just like explain anarchism the origins of antifa etc and clear up just some misconceptions like people who think that antifa is a single centralized organization Mm -hmm. for example and sort of dispelling myths like that anyway um this year though i wanted to go for something a bit less controversial partially so i explicitly wouldn't be just thought of as that anarchism guy Mm -hmm. uh but secondly just because memes are really fascinating to me and so what i've been going through is trying to really stick to the theme of memes and society today so as i said 
all jokes aside, going through what is society, what constitutes society. So looking at how, you know, it's amalgamations of social relations and human communication stuff and seeing how memes really influence uh, one's self-concept, how memes influence how people perceive others, how they perceive institutions, etc., um, I've been like on JSTOR looking for peer-reviewed articles about memes, found some interesting stuff about how the uh, very visual nature of internet memes help enable increased interactivity online by peoples who are like either non-literate or generally older. So whether they're just in general not very literate or more specifically unfamiliar with computers the very visual nature of memes, I think they're analyzing like rural China and Trinidad and stuff. Yeah. The very visual nature of memes makes it easier for people to interact in online communities and stuff because there's less know-how and savvy that goes into posting a, a Kermit meme, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just really like, and I know it sounds silly, like it's a lecture about memes, and I am sort of banking on that. I hope people will come to the lecture because they think it's just going to be one 90-minute shit post. Yeah. But it won't, because I really think part of what really started this off was thinking Donald Trump got elected partially with the help of memes. Yeah. G big corporations like Wendy's. It even affected the 2012 election to a degree. Yeah, no, Don't, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and even, I, I yeah, definitely the 2012, 2016, and just all sorts of even local politics, you can see memes being an issue in foreign politics, memes influencing that outside of politics. Yeah, like Ocasio-Cortez, Ocasio she has a, a meme group on Facebook now. Yeah, the, the dank meme stash meme itself. Mm -hmm. Um and so all that sort of stuff, seeing how Wendy's uses memes, Arby's uses memes and advertising and these other big corporations, uh, and then just seeing how it influences, say, cultural consumption. Gangnam Style was a meme, and it was the first YouTube video to break one billion views. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at these things that aren't just niche, because of course I do want to bring up the niche meme pages, like Theory is My Praxis, and Monstrous <laughs> Metaphysics memes, and all these sort of like obscure, specific meme pages. Or, or the meme you could only understand if you're like under 24 and on the internet heavily, like Lord Farquaad with, with Mark e. Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg with E at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And, or and, humdrum historiography memes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So a uh, page I, I made... Um, well, and that is one of the things, but having been the founder of Fun Silly Drawings for Fun Silly People, haha, -ha, and specifically looking at the explosion of the bone hurting juice. Meme. <laughs> and, yes. and yeah, we covered this, we covered this last time. Yeah, yeah, last time. And one of the things that legitimately interests me about it, rather than just some ego stroking about, oh, this is my meme, but seeing how it isn't my meme. And in the era of the meme it's everybody's meme it's now like, exactly. i've seen it, it takes on a life pervasive for throughout the internet like there's you know there's the big subreddit with it i've oh, even yeah. seen in like band cap reviews they say like for metal albums ow oof this hurts <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like and obviously we have different experiences of seeing bone hurting juice but the point is it's like uh, i'm sort of relying on roland bart's essay the death of the author where he's saying you know these texts are really whatever, uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm probably botching the summary of this, but what the reader perceives and what meaning the reader puts into it is more important than what the author wants his meaning to be. Yeah. And so in this case, where Bone Hurting Juice, for me, was originally just like, it was 2 a.m., I was tired, and I was making a, an edit of a webcomic. It's become its own thing, firstly, so it's no longer attached to the original context of editing a webcomic. Mm -hmm. Now it's just sort of its own thing. And on top of it, people have given it meaning. So people will use bone hurting juice in a way to semi-seriously complain about whatever. Like, they'll be like, uh, you know, I've seen some friends of mine who aren't cis talk about, like, dysphoria juice and they'll be like ooh, you know like ooh, ow you know my dysphoria and, and of course it is like joking but at the same time they're legitimately yeah. venting about it's, it it's it's a way of using that to 
to process what's what's going on in their in their headspace. So yeah, it's exactly yeah, and there's like bipolar and depression meme pages too. For yeah, people to vent yeah. that stuff. Yeah, so it, and seeing that and seeing a meme that was originally just plainly like non sequitur bizarre silly sort of thing that i was going for and seeing it being not even reappropriated i think just seeing it not like the word cuck (laughs) not like the word cuck Uh, just seeing it (laughs) and the and part of why i say not reappropriated is because going with like i even though quote unquote i coined it i don't view it as my meme so rather than some concept of reappropriation it's just people making it manifest as something differently than I made it manifest as. So dealing with stuff like that, with um, rapidly shifting perceptions of like intellectual property in the age of Mm -hmm. memes is something I want to touch on. Uh, One thing, uh, yet another thing, because I do want to ground it in stuff like things that would be important to people outside of the meme sphere. And like any... 40 year olds that would sit on on my lecture or something would still find it relatable and important yeah. etc memes have ended up in every demographic but it could be like vastly different between the age groups like uh like our parents and like uh like aunts and uncles and stuff so they think of memes as like spreading information yeah. or like the some e-cards they don't think of it as like all the memes we know right and that is and that's one thing i do want to cover in my lectures talking about it's like a bit of jargon but polysemy p-o-l-y-s-e-m-y but it it's just a dumb way of saying multiple meanings but talking about how meme as a concept is polysemous and there is no i don't think there is one way to define it like it's just sort of necessarily has multiple meanings and yeah, manifestations and the original term comes from darwin right yeah it does and that's one thing i want to be like what is a meme at the beginning and i'm like if any of you go on wikipedia and look up meme you're probably going to see like oh in richard dawkins the selfish gene blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah um and i'm like and one thing I want to be like is like, this isn't directly relatable. He's using this, not that it's irrelevant, but just one of the things I want to use as an example is like during the 2016 elections, Jeb Bush was a meme and oh, it doesn't, yeah. and it doesn't mean that he's got this, my debating boots on. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't yeah, mean he's dressed up in like the black hoodie, you like <laughs> Jeb Bush is the anarchist we need. Yeah. <laughs> Please clap. And, and it doesn't mean it's this, uh, quasi biological process of spreading information from one channel to another like it 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 connotes something differently it still retains that meaning for sure but it means other things now too Mm -hmm. um so that's something i want to cover and then one more thing i guess I picked up the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit Selected Writings 1997 to 2003 a little bit ago. If anyone, if either of you know Nick Land, it's fine if you don't. He sort of uh, made a notorious name for himself by shifting to like this weird sort of quasi neo fascist hyper capitalist right accelerationism, is what it's called. But. Yeah, but these writings are pre that, back Mm. when he was just at, I forget which university, but just some English university high on amphetamine and listening listening to drum and bass all the time, apparently. So, (laughs) So, sort of the career trajectory of Frank Miller, basically. Yeah, Yeah. pretty much. (laughs) But uh, one of the concepts within his and others in the research unit's writings is hyperstition which is a fiction that makes itself real. Mm. And so looking at the hyperstitious nature of memes, like with the okay sign meaning white power, allegedly, oh, and how yeah. that started as a slash poll hoax, and how they're just joking, and they're saying like, huh, watch the liberal media say that the okay sign means white power. And then on the news, at the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, apparently there was a lady behind him giving the okay signal, and everybody was like, she gave a secret white power sign. Yeah. And so... Yeah, that was a fiction that made itself real. That's yeah. freaky. And not only did it make itself real by the media reporting that as such, because I feel at that step, it might be hard to argue like, well, did it really make itself real? Or is that just journalists talking about it? The thing where I really find the the circle to be completed is when you go back that 
go media back, reporting go back to the like the message boards where that idea originated from and now it's, it's unironic and, and now it's, it's just you have white supremacists sincerely using yeah, that's the when, okay sign that's when the circle is closed and uh, and that's yeah. when it really becomes hyperstition yeah. so and so that's sort of the process that we've begun with this podcast of completely rewriting <laughs> of completely rewriting the word cuck yeah yeah Re- reassigning its meaning we're probably going to do that with the giant bugs too. Eventually, yeah. that's going to become real. We're and make I want to take Pepe the Frog back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's let, on behalf of the creator, because poor guy, he had to kill off Pepe the Frog because he was just like, I can't, I can't let him be used by Nazis. I'm just going to kill him. And that's another example of where the author is dead, because of course, plenty yep. of people still use Pepe. Yep. No stopping it. He just all he can do is distance himself from it. Yeah. On but... Tumblr, it was always rare Pepe. Collect this one. <laughs> They were never rare. No. No, no, never. they were fucking everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so so yeah, I guess that's um a general sorry if that was a little rambly, but um No, in, it's it's really interesting yeah, that stuff. Was fascinating. Well thank you. But yeah, so that's what I'll be lecturing on. Um but part of why I'm doing some research now is because I'm transferring from Palomar and I've uh I'm transferring up to UCLA. And I move in on the 23rd, so this upcoming Sunday. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to get some work in while I can, because I'll probably be busy with classes mm-hmm. for a fair amount of time. But but yeah, so memes, memes, memes. They start off, they start off as just a small idea, but then as they branch out and and multiply, they mutate and become far larger than they ever were. Sort of like insects, really. Yes. Yeah, some people are still using rage face. <laughs> oh fuck, that's right. <laughs> Uh, i have seen honestly troll face has never died in my heart because (laughs) it's it's a funny face (laughs) it really is when you get right down to it i i love farmer memes (laughs) just in general the rural memes like when you sit in your truck and there's no bottom text Yeah, I know I, that feel of saying it I always, at 250. <laughs> I always, I always love the ones where it's just like, it's a lead-in that clearly necessitates a, a, a like a punchline, and then it just says bottom text. <laughs> <laughs> when you're sitting in your truck, bottom text. <laughs> you have an, another meme page like paragraph split between or a sentence split between the top and bottom text. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's defunct now, but it was some. It was like doge memes where the top text like where this one sentence in the top text splits off and starts again in the bottom text i forget the exact page name but all i would do is like find random wikipedia articles and just like copy bits of information so stuff about like dialects of arabic or sardinia or whatever and i would just put the summary sentence and just and just like interrupt a word so when would be like in the top text w h and then it would continue in the bottom text e n it was i don't know what was going through my mind um so specific there there was uh an instagram post i made like a year ago where it was just a photo of san diego bay and I took the first paragraph from the Wikipedia page of Rat Race 2003. <laughs> yeah. And people will do that with, like, Slipknot's Wikipedia page. Like, that'll be their whole post. <laughs> I love it. I actually, yeah, I love copy-pasting from Wikipedia. <laughs> but, yeah, TLDR memes are fucking weird. They are. And they interest me, but... God, what is it from Fifty Shades of Grey? Like the thing, it was a meme itself, but it's like my interests are unconventional or my desires are <laughs> unconventional. Yeah. So I feel like that, and then you just have a, a factory farm full of ants, <laughs> <laughs> all with smartphones just churning out tur- churning out nihilistic memes <laughs> to feed to feed the corporate machine that kills them and. Sent and feeds them to people. That literally kills them. Kills them and turns them into food for consumption. A farmer meme. My desires are unconventional bale of hay. <laughs> <laughs> Ant. My desires are unconventional. And then it's just that that scene from Men in Black where Vincent D'Onofrio is just like, sugar water. <laughs> <laughs> My desires are unconventional. Sugar water. 
<laughs> but the sugar water is made out of cricket milk. <laughs> so it's more of a sugar milk, really. <laughs> Back from a memeing break. By which you meant a bathroom break. <laughs> a bathroom break where we just made memes. Where the bathroom break is the meme. What is meme? What is reality? Nobody knows anymore. It's true. It's there's once you reach a certain saturation of ironic detachment, it just circles all the way back to authentic reality. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I saw a meme once that was just a picture of a glass of water and the text just said water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just that's exactly what happened. It's just too much ironic detachment. It goes back to just absolute literalism. Yeah. It's not even Dadaism. It's not even just saying, like, this isn't water. It just says water. <laughs> an impact font. <laughs> of course, well, I mean, of course it's an impact font. Duh. I think, what if it was just in, like, Arial or Helvetica, though? <laughs> like, would that make it worse or better? I feel like that or would... Comic Sans. I feel like that would, that would signal that m- memes have reset. We've, we've passed, we've passed the threshold... We've we've gone through the event horizon and now we're back at the beginning. Ni- Nineteen eighty eight ARPANET. If yeah. I started a real, you can start meme- again. Uh, if I started a real meme page, I would use the bleeding cowboys font on everything. The <laughs> one that every bad local ba- metal band uses. Oh yes. Not only every bad local metal band, but also Uncle Adams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uses bleeding cowboys. That's right. Yeah. What an inspiration. He he convinced me to stop bullying at my middle school with his song Original. <laughs> I came out two years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I am very young. <laughs> no, but uh what do you guys think of Uncle Adams? Are you are you nephews? <laughs> um I mean the music's just bad to me. I don't know who Uncle Adams is, and at this point I'm too afraid to ask, but I just admitted it out loud, so I feel like that's the same thing as asking. Yeah, so let's... Do you mind... Am I allowed to play some... Uh, uh, yeah, or I could just pull up the video on here. Okay. Uh, I don't have a speaker hooked up, so maybe it is better on your phone. Okay, so let's... Uh, let's... Let's get some good... Let's get some good stuff. Alright. And... It's a Domino's. Oh, I love this song. <laughs> All right, Uncle Adams is great. I, I love Domino's right. advertisements. Uh, just so we got our just so we got our asses covered, uh, just give them the name of this song so that they can pause the episode and go and look this up for themselves. And then... Uncle Adams with a K, original. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I have to see the music video. <laughs> True. So, yeah. So, yeah, just pause the episode, go look up Uncle Adams with a K. The song's called Original, and then come back. It's... It's an 11 out of 10. La 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 la, let's start the show. I don't want to be how everybody else is. I'd much rather be original. I'm the kind of character that's written in mythology, living in the present day. It's in my biology. (laughs) I'm not a know-it-all, I'm full of curiosity, I'm fascinated by the stars and their luminosity, guided by a prophecy working... I feel like this is what would happen if Eminem stumbled into one of those, like, old-timey photo booths where they have the costumes and everything and then forgot to come out. He has a song where the the hook is, No, I'm not Eminem. No, I'm not Macklemore. I'm Uncle Adams. <laughs> <laughs> and did I see that right? Did he have... Did he have, like, an EKG readout stenciled into his haircut? Yes, he has it shaved onto his that. onto his wretched scalp. <laughs> That's <laughs> not good. No, it's it's not good. It's great. <laughs> oh. Anyway, oh you God. can you can consider me. <laughs> you can consider me a nephew. I'm part of uh, Uncle Adam's original posting on Facebook.com, <laughs> and I gotta say. At first, it was ironic appreciation, but then I listened. Um, then I listened to him a bit more, and I realized he's really bad, and there's no redeemable features, and it's uh, and it's just really good. 
<laughs> there was a uh, like small feud that he had with Anthony Fantano, and then they solved it in like a Skype call. And like I could see at that point, like okay, like he's doing this intentionally, so I kind of get where he's coming from, but it's still ridiculously bad music. Yeah, and well, <laughs> that's the thing. I think he's tried to embrace his status as a meme and as someone people listen to ironically. But since Yeah, I, like Tommy was so hard to just realize at some point that everybody sees it as a comedy. Exactly. Even if he had the persona intention. that you didn't realize you were creating. Although here's the thing. I think that's a good comparison, but one difference is that Tommy Wiseau is at the end of the day fucking like I'm not saying he's actually bonkers, <laughs> but he's kind of bonkers yeah. and like he's operating on a different wavelength than most people. Exactly. And Uncle Adams For isn't quite real. there. Yeah. Uncle Adams doesn't actually just function like an alien entity the way Tommy he's, Wiseau He's a does. normal guy trying to be like, look how strange I am. Yeah, well, not That's... look how strange I am. Look how much I care about bullying and don't bully people. Yeah, like he's trying to spread a positive message, but it comes off kind of corny. And yeah. also, not only corny, but really hypocritical because people have unearthed his earlier music mm. where like there's a diss track where the hook is... Uh, feel free to bleep me out, but I'm just quoting. Uh, but, you know, he uses the F slur. That is to say, the hook is just, hey, faggot. And, like, no, and it's no. really nasty to listen to. And I'm like, ooh. It's like listening back to Where the Hood at and realizing that, that word comes up a lot. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, once you realize he, he wasn't even just a cornily positive guy. You know, and, which in and, its own way would have been charming if it was at least genuine, right? But once you have that little bit of insincerity, yeah. it makes mocking him a little less uh, guilt guilt yeah. inducing. Yeah, I feel a little bit like it seems a little off to like dig up what people were doing in like the early two thousands because that was like purposefully everybody was trying to be offensive back then. True, that's there was... like what all the movies were like. TV was like that, and then like it swung to like culture is like starting to be politically correct again what while i do agree and while there definitely was that like as you were saying sort of eminem influence of just being edgy and stuff i do think the the fact that he attempted to do a 180 without without uh talking about his past and being mm -hmm. like i know i used to do these raps yeah, just rather but just I've pretending it didn't happen right like, and it's one thing to turn over a new leaf yeah. it's another to pretend there was never another side to like mark leaf. Wahlberg being a lovable movie star even though he punched the vietnamese guy so hard in the face he went blind in one eye yeah yeah like, and then just pretending that didn't happen <laughs> yeah so th i th you bring up a good point. Yeah, I kind of mean in general, not his specific case, because I know you know Uncle Adam's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know him personally. I do. He's going to be so mad when he hears this podcast. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> Uncle Adam's him. thought he could trust his favorite nephew. <laughs> <laughs> he was wrong. Trust nobody. I'm I'm out I'm out here to slander him for that yummy yummy yellow journalism money. <laughs> <laughs> yellow ju journalism and the yellow plaid shirt. I just dabbed. dabbed. Let's call out these sweet dabs when we see them. <laughs> oh, dude, but, you totally cucked Uncle Adams. I more like cuckle Adams. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I think he's uh, at the end of the day. I think he's the best rapper out there. <laughs> I think uh, Killer Mike, um, Danny Brown, Vince Staples are all trash. <laughs> Hot garbage. Uncle Adams, number one, <laughs> number one rapper of all time. Hey, I'd rather be original. Exactly, as he. Yes. Yes. I actually have Uncle Adam's hair thing tattooed on my own scalp. You just can't see it. I just can't see it. But it's there. Are either of you devoted devoted fans of any widely acclaimed and wonderful artists? Well, like I, mean, I am. Uncle Adam's now. You you've you've converted me. Yeah. Yes. I've come over. <laughs> 
How about you, Ian? Yeah. Are you ready to be a nephew? <laughs> no. <laughs> Fair. The few, the proud, the nephews. <laughs> Oh, start a cover band called the Nephews, where you just cover Uncle Adam songs. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's the kids. That's the kids' pop ripoff group <laughs> that exclusively covers Uncle Adams. I would listen to that. I'm just imagining like a really shitty drum kit that's being played by someone who can't keep time. Yeah. Sort of like the Shags. You know, uh, remember the Shags yeah, philosophy sh- of the world? Yeah, I actually really like the so, Shags. No, yeah, I do too, but imagine the Shags singing Uncle Adam's yeah. lyrics. <laughs> there, there, I, I think I read into this like years ago. There was a sad story behind the Shags, like their father forced them to be in the band and become stars. He was trying to fulfill his own dreams. Yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. But they left behind a great outsider music legacy, sort of, <laughs> mildly iTunes used to have like And then the, one of them became Uncle Adams. <laughs> I I started like let's say know a lot of music on iTunes and they would have like these specific categories like nineties emo or like outsider music. So I found like the shags in there and like maybe swans, like a lot of weird bands. Ooh. Although it's oh, I'm imagining what if Or you... Moondog, maybe. Sun yeah. Rock. Moondog is definitely like outsider. What what if there was a what if there's a crossover, like a collab, not a split, an actual collab between the Shags and Swans? I mean, you could call it a Shaggy Swan. <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> Shag- that would be terrible. Shag- I would fucking Shaggy hate that. Swan. Just a really unkempt and disheveled swan. <laughs> that that screams. <laughs> He's hungover. <laughs> Shaggy who let the dogs out. <laughs> Baha Men and the Shags remix. (laughs) I forget that Who Let the Dogs Out was recorded by an actual group that, Mm. like, existed. Yeah, Yeah. I had their full album CD. Are they good? If you don't think about it, it just seems like something that was made in a computer. Yeah. Yeah, there was a good reason they were a one-hit wonder. Like, I think the full album had a ton of filler. Like, explain... Could you do some acapella? Uh, so, no, I couldn't because the songs weren't catchy enough. That's the thing. They were so forgettable. Oh. Like, Who Let the Dogs Out? From what I remember, that's like the one good song. So let's try an improv of Baja Men song that is one of the filler tracks. <laughs> what what sort of instruments did they use? Um, Kettle drums. Yeah, kettle drums and... I think there was some guitar. Uh, horns. And a bunch of guys going... Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Well, there, we have a song right there. Yeah, that was that was. I think that was the main instrument. That and kettle drums, <laughs> barking and kettle drums. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was like more of like a laid back calypso kind of DMX. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I would listen to laid back calypso DMX. Where where the hood at? Woof woof woof. <laughs> I'm I okay. I was thinking of steel drums instead of kettle drums. As, as was I. I forgot which one was which. So I'm just thinking of like under the sea. Yeah, I think that's what I meant. I'm mixing up <laughs> some words. Xco, give it to you. What? <laughs> it's like the Thomas the Tank Engine and Biggie Smalls. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, dude. There, there were a couple shows where my improv team went out on stage to that mix, the uh, the Thomas the Tank Engine Biggie Smalls mix. How was it received? Very well, in fact. I think some of those shows it was it was the best received part of the entire set. Hell, I don't. I was about to say hell yeah. I don't know if that's hell yeah. I don't know. Is it hell yeah? Clue I, me in. I would say yeah. Okay, hell yeah. Yeah. As long as you get any kind of positive reaction, it's good enough. That's fair. Speaking of Hell Yeah, remember the band Hell Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> with the member of Pantera. Yeah, I Hell saw no. They were bad. I saw them live uh, when I went to see Iced Earth, uh-huh. another throwback. When I was <laughs> oh, like, shit, I just remembered Iced Earth. Yeah. You unlocked that memory. Hell yeah, but uh, Hell Yeah, when I was like 11, mm-hmm. sing Hell Yeah, and they... They had one song literally called Hell Yeah, and it's like, hell yeah. I don't know. It's just really awful. I'm sure that's right. 
<laughs> something like that. They say hell yeah. Mm-hmm. And then one of their official band photos is them in front of, of like a JPEG of fire. Yeah. And I just forgot that. And I think their logo is like Microsoft Word Art. <laughs> yeah, Jack and I um saw Dragon Force oh, on yeah. Mayhem Fest. Hey, hey. Mm-hmm. their their intro was uh like a like a overused classical piece, and uh and then it ended with like diarrhea sounds. <laughs> yeah, they were farting over it, which is literally just oh man. If you were in if you were in seventh grade at the time, boy oh boy, was that life changing. <laughs> Wait, so they had. Wait, ex- I'm actually confused. It's, Explain to me. Like before they went on, like the curtain was up and everything, and then like over the last few just like oh. and then it abruptly stops for fart noises before they start playing, and like sounds of things dropping into buckets. Like it got graphic. <laughs> That's fucking and then gross. and then like guitar starts, and then the curtain opens up, and there's fog and flames and shit. And everybody's like, yeah, and everybody forgets about how retro, like. Looking back, how fucking dumb that was. <laughs> the lead guitarist had his own, like, personal fan to make his hair go back. Really? Of course, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he's got to keep up that Dragon Force image. That's honestly incredible. Although, I think one thing that would have made it better would be if, instead of just interrupting the classical music with, with diarrhea noises. <laughs> and then, Violent, violent diarrhea noises. And then going into Dragon Force, they should have just kept the diarrhea noises, but then ran them through distortion and a pitch shifter and had, a, and had like a gore noise set <laughs> instead of Dragon Force. I think that, I think, uh, how long did they play? Like how, how long? Um, I, I think like an hour. They were later in the night. Yeah. Not, not the headliner. So like an hour of dragon force doing gore noise just on just stage. tons of audio and i would assume like a performance piece too of them like acting this out as they just pretend to violently shit themselves to death pretend <laughs> everybody thinks they're pretending you find out a week later that dragon force actually died <laughs> and that all that shit was real you took some of it home in a plastic bag as a souvenir sorry that's actual shit but <laughs> With that knowledge, you can just make some jankum. <laughs> can just ferment. Oh my god! Ferment your dragon shit. I, I had a shipmate uh, when I was working on that boat who was obsessed with the concept of jankum. <laughs> he would talk about it at any turn, and uh, one of our captains uh, heard him say it in conversation. And this is like uh, late a man who was in his late thirties, early forties, and says, "What the hell is jankum?" <laughs> And then this shipmate explains it to him. He's like, you're fucking with me. Come on, that's not real. He's like, oh, yeah, that's real. No. And then he looks to me. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it's real. And then he looks around to everybody. And they're just like, yep, he's not kidding. And he's probably kidding about doing it, at least right now, because we're at work. But, like, that's a real thing. And then he just puts out his cigarette. It doesn't get walks onto the though. Walks onto the boat and goes below deck. And I did not see him for about... A half hour as he had to just process that he was probably making jank he was probably checking in on his on his supply <laughs> he was he was pretending that he didn't know what it was so he could cover <laughs> you said it doesn't get you high yeah a, a person i knew who did like lots of drugs yeah that. a person yeah. you knew <laughs> yeah probably this person tried it and didn't get high they didn't make it right then <laughs> not not enough fermentation you know, 420 Chan, there's a Jankum board. They have a board entirely for Jankum. <laughs> or they did at least like a year ago. Uh, uh, the, four, the 420 board has a has its own board for Jankum? No, 420 Chan. For, oh, for, okay, 420 Chan. I'm it's just, its I'm own just, website. I'm just thinking like, I would think there's at least like one middleman between weed and Jankum. There's got to be at least like one degree of separation because just going from weed to Jankum, it seems like a bit of a leap. I think, uh, well, remember the page Marijuana Makes You Violent? I I remember a lot of uh, PSAs from the 1950s that boiled down to that. There's this Facebook page, I think it's technically still up, but not really active, called Marijuana Makes You Violent. <laughs> and they would post a lot of stuff in that rhetorical vein, but with a kind of silly edge. Anyway, long story short, I'm going to imitate their style and say, if any... Ganja Gremlin 
is <laughs> is degenerate and corrupt enough to smoke the devil's lettuce, they're probably <laughs> corrupt enough to huff jank. Uh, that's my two cents. Hey, hey. Take it or leave it, sinners. L- listen here, kids. Jank makes you jank. E. <laughs> And then I'm just, I'm just imagining that I'm like a, a hip youth pastor with a guitar on his lap. And now I want to talk to you kids. You know, you might want to be trying like, you know, all these new things, all these new, all these new <laughs> things that make you hip. But uh, let me just tell you, crack is whack and jank makes you jank. And then I just strum a little bit and sing about how Christ is God. Christ is God. Jank ain't so dank. <laughs> jank isn't dank, buds. <laughs> and neither are buds, buds. <laughs> Can we? I really want to convince like moral guardians that Jankum is something to have an actual moral panic over. <laughs> so they devote all their time and resources into getting kids away away from Jank. Or yeah, you could you could start a page and like make it seem sincere and promote the shit out of it. Like buy like twenty dollar ads and all that. <laughs> what if what if we attack? Target from, it to yeah. like soccer moms. <laughs> what if we attack from both angles? We convince half the soccer moms that they should have a moral panic over Jankum, and we convince the other half, the anti vaxxer soccer moms, that it's that it's like a holistic treatment for things. <laughs> <laughs> and that they should make and it's it's an amazing holistic therapy medication that you can make in your own home with only with only ingredients that come from your own body. The latter, we just need to target it to and anybody who likes natural news or David Avocado. And then we just let all the soccer moms maul each other over this. And all of them are asking to see the manager, but there's no manager. <laughs> just Jankum. <laughs> there, is, there is no manager. There is only Jankum. I can... Okay, real shit, though. No pun intended. I think I, <laughs> I could see, like, anti-vaxxer soccer moms... I mean, I I think I've already seen like using feces as like a skin cleaner thing. Some of them purposefully get bee stings. Well, I mean, that's I've heard I've heard plenty about that. I have not heard about this one because like, come on, man! Everybody knows that feces spreads diseases. It's true though. Yeah. Funny pronunciation aside. Wait, though. Remember the King of the Hill episode where Dale? Oh God! Oh, yeah, be... yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was good. He just stings his own arm a thousand times, just like. It's a swollen mess. It's like, I don't understand. I'm not allergic to anything except bees. <laughs> you completely forgot until that point. <laughs> oh, but yeah. Uh, Clong of the hole. They definitely use piss. <laughs> like minute, soccer. Are you, you're telling me that anti-vaxxer soccer moms are into water sports? Yeah, kind of. Jesus. Not for sexual purposes, but I know that there are some of them who drink their piss for medicinal purposes Mm -hmm. jesus christ and there's few degrees of separation between piss and and jank i think yeah i mean like just just a couple inches really yeah so if you're doing medicinal jank medicinal jank i think you could get at least it's like marketed like ayahuasca trips (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think you could get at least one 43 year old woman named rebecca but who goes by (laughs) becky and oh. wears fake Gucci shades. And dresses like a cheerleader, even though she's in her in her 40s. Yeah, to do Jankum. <laughs> uh, this is what I'm going to do. Wow. This is my life goal. We've <laughs> got make, this all figured out. Make soccer moms do Jank 20, 2019. And offer we, uh, corporate Jankum retreats. <laughs> <laughs> we have gotten... We have come up with a lot of great ways to completely destroy society in a handful <laughs> of years on this podcast. I'd like to thank you for coming back on. I'd like to thank all you folks for listening. This episode was brought to you by Farmer Greg's Giant Bug Farm, the best place for crickets <laughs> and ants and worms. All of your delicious bug needs, come to Farmer Greg. Consider tri- taking a trip on American Airlines' new giant butterflies. Yeah. To uh, the brand, the, the s- spanking <laughs> brand new Jankum Resort. <laughs> A place for soccer moms. <laughs> we eminent domained all the islands of the Pacific for Jacob. <laughs> including inc- including the walking daddy long leg islands. <laughs> They're just Jankum pits too. Thank you so much for listening, guys. We have we've been a bunch of bastards. Oh well. Oh well. Oh, um, do you have anything else you need to plug? just the lecture right now just the lecture right now but thank you for asking and thank you for having me on sincerely it's been a pleasure we'll have you back on anytime hell yeah as long as the crickets don't eat our hands i'm going into dentistry by the way (laughs) good luck you'll need it